Hello, my name is Kate and I live with my husband Chris in Wakefield. I'm a 32 year old elderly medicine registrar working in Yorkshire in the UK. There's nothing unusual about that really, but I'm also a cancer patient, a terminally ill one with a very rare and aggressive form of sarcoma. On my blog I muse about current issues, especially relating to end of life care, communication and patient centeredness. I also write about my experiences as I approach the end of my life. Kate and I met in a nightclub in Huddersfield of all places. We've been together ever since. Kate was first diagnosed approximately two and a half years ago now. At the stage of our lives that we were at, it really was quite a bombshell. We'd both got successful careers, we were just about starting to plan a family. You just don't expect it in your late 20s, early 30s that you're going to have to deal with something like this. As a doctor, I was a lot more familiar with death. Breaking bad news is something that happens all the time in a hospital and we, we do it and we go home and we carry on living our lives as doctors. Once. I'd had that news myself, I think I'd started to realise the impact on that person and that when you go home as a doctor, you leave that person with that news and they have to live it. All I wanted um, when I was first diagnosed was to be treated normally, just to be treated as Kate. You know, we are just a normal couple at the end of the day. Um, and whatever normal is. I like to call it a gremlin that sits on our shoulders and gives us a little poke now and again. In the beginning, I really quite enjoyed making people feel uncomfortable about my attitude towards death and dying and talking about it openly. You can't tell people how to feel about a topic. You can't enforce a particular a view, but you can suggest another way of thinking about things. One way I'm trying is by using social media. I love Twitter. I think it's a, it's a massive community of support out there that you can access day and night. I think Chris thinks I'm a little bit addicted. <laughs> Having cancer, there's loads of positives. It's brilliant. <laughs> no, no, there are. No, no, I can talk about positives. Um, I just need to look like I'm not dying. So. <laughs> I think humour is a great tool to facilitate openness, and I think. I've always had a dark sense of humour. I think it goes with being a doctor. Probably my favourite joke. Um, around me dying belongs to my mum um, and she she bought me a very expensive handbag and when I said mum you really shouldn't have spent so much money on me she said well it doesn't really matter does it because you don't need your inheritance do you? Chris pulled a good one a few months ago and he said I asked him if I could have another cake and whether it would be too fat and he, he said no it doesn't really matter because you're dying. <laughs> did, you, did you have another one? Yeah. <laughs> Writing is something that's part of my life now. It never was before. I never intended to share my illness. In fact, when I was first diagnosed, I was really private about it. I didn't even tell everyone on Facebook until maybe about eight or nine weeks into what was happening. Then I started keeping a diary um, about what was happening and reflections on my care and the relationships that I was building with my doctors and the people looking after me.
having a plan that sets out where you'd like to be, what you'd like to happen, it's reassuring to a family. Planning in end of life care is a very fluid, very dynamic process um, that can change every week, can change every day, could change every hour towards the end. I know exactly how she wants everything to be. So I need to make sure that nothing's overruled by anybody based on what they think. Rightly or wrongly, people might not agree with that decision, but that's the decision that Kate wants adhering to, and I have to make sure that that's done. A death plan is almost like a birth plan. You have to be willing and that things may go wrong along the way and you may not get your wishes. But if you don't have a plan at all, then you're definitely not going to get your wishes. The time is going to come when I am going to be on my deathbed and deathbed life is going to come into play. What I'd like from that time is a time with my family and friends kind of shut off from the outside world in a lot of ways. We decided that instead of dying here, I'm going to go to my mum and dad's to give Chris more support and a bit more emotional and physical help with me. And I'd like to have enough pain relief to be not in pain, but I don't want to be sedated. And strange how it sounds, I've picked my music and my candles and the books I'd like my mum to read to me. And I hope that my vision of a fairly serene, peaceful death is achieved. But I know from past experience that that may not be the case. Um, At least I'll have some lovely music. <laughs>
I think you just have to get on and do it. Charities like Day Matter are very important in raising the profile of, of these conversations and opening up channels of communication. She's already made funeral plans, she's put them in a box so I know where they are um, so that at that time we can just get those out and go through the motions. We've had conversations about how Chris is going to cope once I've died and what he might do with his career and, and things like that. And those conversations are, are difficult to have and we both get upset at times but I think by being open about it we're both more comfortable in our own skins living the life that we live in. Having a terminal cancer diagnosis has definitely changed my perspective on life. Um, I appreciate small things in life a lot more than I ever did before. So seeing the cherry blossom because I might not see it again. Um, just spending time with my friends and family, watching my nephew grow up. Those things are really important. There's been some really, really low points in that journey, um, both from a illness perspective and from a um, family perspective. But then there's also been some extreme high points, which I don't feel many people will experience in their whole lifetimes. My particular journeys led me down paths to Buckingham Palace, to all sorts of awards and accolades that I never would have achieved without having cancer. In order to stimulate a change in society, I think you almost have to shock. Um, I think that's the society that we live in. I think that's how people stop and think. And I guess that's the power of some of the work I've been doing. Hello, my name is, was born out of a hospital experience last year. It's about building a connection, about starting a relationship. One of the ideas that we came up with, which I think I actually came up with, but Kate will take more of the glory for this, was... Hashtag, hello, my name is... We presented it at the NHS Care and Innovation Expo and I think um, until that point Chris hadn't really realised how much of an impact it had had on so many people um, until he realised what a celebrity his wife had become. It's spread like wildfire, it, it's gone um, national, international. I'm clearly having an impact on other people's lives, but yeah, I just see myself as a normal girl going about a daily business. Kate's work will continue um, through various people, me included, um, well into the future. And hashtag hello my name is, will be a big part of that. But there's more than just that, it's her inspiration and courage to others. Whatever the future may bring for, for both of us, We've got to be blessed that we've had that time together, be it 10 years, be it 50 years. We've had that time and not everybody in life is as fortunate as what we have been to have that time. I'd like my main legacy to be a better NHS that considers patients as people, not just diseases or conditions. And I hope I've managed to achieve that a little bit by making people stop and think about how they communicate with people. <laughs>